Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to the show. Welcome back. It's Action Movie Anatomy. It's Thursday. We're talking about the only James Cameron film we've never talked about on this show. It's The Abyss. We're here to talk about how freaking sweet Ed Harris's baby blues are. We'll see you guys in just one quick second. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. And now, here's Popcorn Talk's Action Movie Anatomy. Boom! All that timing was hot. Huh. It was hot. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. Yeah. I'm, you've sold me on the show. <laughs> I'm in on the show. I'll do the show today. Uh, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. Ha-ha. Mm. Nine, five, four plus three pennies. Surprising that we're both <laughs> still alive after this last yes. Saturday, my friend. Oh, it's been a hell of a week. You know, I, I periodically, because YouTube doesn't have a way on a single show on a single channel to uh, tally views. Oh, okay. you know that periodically I will go through. And yes, I, will I, add I up. really greatly appreciate you doing that. The more, the more years we get into the show, the longer it takes. Uh, periodically I'll do it. We're, we're somewhere in the nearing 25 million all time views on this show range. Yeah. Um, we're, I can't remember the number offhand. I think we're in the 23s, maybe. But um, I have to go back and click on each episode. And I did this yesterday. And I have introed the show with the same tonality. Hey, guys, what's up? The same way for so long. Hey, guys, what's up? Yeah. I couldn't believe how many times in a row the it intro sounds, sounds identical. The same. Yeah. It was blowing my mind. I was like, I am so obnoxious. Well... <laughs> The thing is, is that's the way it should be, right? Yeah. Like, like if you think about the actual logistics of making a show, you should be able to click 30 seconds into the show every time and yeah. probably the same thing be happening because the intro should be the same. It's Yeah, it's cr it was crazy to me. I couldn't believe it. I, I didn't realize how consistent the intro has been. That's so interesting. Um, everything. It, I mean, literally the tone of my voice. Like, it's higher. Hey, guys, what's going on? Yep. Like, just like that. Yeah, it was blowing my mind. Anyway, guys, welcome back. It's Action Movie Anatomy. It's <laughs> anyway, here. Anyway, guys, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> We're uh, coming to you on the Popcorn Talk Network, the online broadcast network dedicated to talking movies, all things movie-related, and pop culture by the bucket full. Today, we're talking about The Abyss, the unfortunate-placed film for James Cameron that came out between Aliens and Terminator 2. Yeah. Uh, so it's just kind of a forgotten movie. It's uh, This is actually one of the films that we are doing for our patrons, this is a particularly special film because we're doing it for Paul DeNuzzo, Brigadier General of the Action Army. We salute you, of we course. We salute you, General. And uh, this was one of his choices. So it's a great choice. There's a lot of things in this movie that we love. And we're excited to be here to talk to you guys about it. How you doing, man? I'm good. Yeah? I'm good. Yeah, no, I... Uh... I'd never really sat down and fully watched this movie from beginning to end as an adult until until recently. Yeah, so this is a movie that I recall like one time at summer camp when I was like 12 or 10 or something, probably 10 or younger actually. Uh, this was like the movie they were showing on like movie night or something huh. I, I, for some reason. Right. I don't like really remember, but I didn't watch it. But I remember that was a thing. So like The Abyss was like a appropriate for like young teens. And then, like, my brother watched this movie and liked it. Because it's PG-13. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And it's on cable periodically. But mm -hmm. weirdly enough with this movie, and I texted you this last night, this movie is unavailable in the United States. It's not available. You can't stream it. You can't buy a Blu-ray new. It's not available on Netflix. You have to watch it illegally or you have to watch it in another country. Yeah, I think that's so interesting that you... I mean, I full disclosure <laughs> here, I just stream all of my stuff mostly illegally. If it's not on Netflix and, and, uh, and Hulu... You can you can bet that I'll find a way to watch it. <laughs> um, but so when you sent that to me, I was very surprised, and I don't know what that is, but it does kind of make sense because of James Cameron. You'd think that he'd have like this incredibly strong legal team, but you can watch all of his highest grossing movies pretty easily online. He's been talking about for years, apparently, about a, a HD version re-release re of this, like a remaster that he's going to release. But it's like you know he's busy working on Avatar sequel, so he's not doing it. Um, and I just couldn't believe it. I like tweeted this out, and like Burnett was like, "I have a Robert Meyer Burnett tweeted at me, and he was like, I have a multi-disc special edition HD. I love that film. You can borrow it sometime. Just kidding. Win a belt, maybe you can. Oh, um, God, I kill him. <laughs> kill him. <laughs> uh, and like, it, I just couldn't believe it. People were tweeting at me. They're like, uh, I mean, this doesn't help, but I can stream it in the UK. This doesn't help, but I can stream it in Germany. That's so crazy. And that's the first time it's ever come up in our entire catalog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even Bib with the searchers, we were able to find it online easily. Yeah, Bibiani uh, quoted my tweet, and he said, and he said. That's it, folks. Invest in digital and so in physical media. <laughs> is that really what he did? Yeah. He, I thought you were just making a joke at how annoying he is. No, he's like, <laughs> he was like, that's it, folks. Invest in physical media. 
And then he's like, ha, 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 ha. I own a VHS copy. Um, so we like him. Uh, that's a thing. Uh, suck so at guys, a bit, says Nick Gilmore. <laughs> what do you suck at a bit? <laughs> uh, so, guys, this is the action movie anatomy. Yeah, we, we, we talk about action movies every week on this show that adhere to four basic rules. Yeah, rule number one, the uh, the the the... The hero, the hero always, always plays by their own rules. I yeah. was trying to find a tweet. So. I know that's why I was. Yeah. I was trying to help you out. Uh, uh, and please, you're more than welcome to keep going. Um, I'm going to try to tackle the rules. This is exciting. Rule number one: the hero always <laughs> uh, plays by his own rules. Uh, Do you think he does? And I think He's, I think he does. I mean, he he knows when he needs to listen. Well, right. And he says he says like there's a. Uh, there's two things protecting these people's lives. It's me and God. And yeah. if they're in danger, I'm pulling the plug. He's yep. like, I don't give a shit what you say. So he does. He definitely does. Yeah, absolutely he does. And it's Ed Harris. Like, Ed Harris is not a guy that likes to play by other people's rules much anyway. Uh, rule number two, the hero and the villain are always the smartest people in the room. It's interesting because the villain, you, is, is, you're not sure if the yeah. aliens are a villain, but it's actually Michael Bean. Yeah. Uh, and he's definitely not the smartest person in the room. He's actually lost his mind, which is why he is, uh, he's turned if you will so um i'd say i'd say we're, we're 50 50 on that one uh rule number three the movie is driven by a police military political figure or someone that works for the man or could be the man right so you could be an mta operator in the uh, taking a pelham one two three i always say officer uh, i do uh that that does that, are they government employed officers on this thing do I, they work for the man on this ship yeah maybe guys private it, i'm not sure people talking and uh rule number four there's a minimum of one explosion uh yeah there's yeah. some things that explode yeah sure. there's implosions too. yeah that yeah. was a sweet one do you like that what yeah. i did there nice <laughs> um so a couple things first of all mark edward huke huick uh mark huick who's uh oh yeah he's a person that's not as good as us as movie trivia right is he in the schmodown or was i can't remember if he was like announced or if he ever competed I, his name was at one point talked about as a, in, as a part of a team or something Right? Didn't like, he join? Bri wasn't he Brienne's second no, half in the? No, Brienne's with McQueenie. I no, think. no, no. It, when she went for the title. No, that was Brian something. This is a totally different person. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. Mark. H so, so he used to be on a show called Beat the Geeks, which was like a an old cable show where okay. like, people were like big nerds. Anyway, he tweeted at me when I tweeted this, and what his his uh, his comment was. Fox's relationship with Cameron is such that he has to sign off on anything they do with his films. Plus, he owns copyrights on True Lies, so much like with Peter Jackson's early horror, he wants to supervise new transfers, but of course, he's always too busy and nothing happens. Kind of what you were suggesting. Got Legal it. team, total control, that's who Cameron is. Makes sense. Yeah, that makes that totally makes sense. Um, Mar Marissa Serafini, who's up in the booth. How you doing, Marissa? I'm great, gentlemen. How are you? We're doing well. You know, something a few weeks ago when we were doing the show that came up was it sounded a little bit like in our headphones, the sound of our voices were peaking, just barely. And uh, on playback, it didn't seem to be a problem. But then last week, I noticed the same thing. And on playback, I did hear it a little bit on the actual episode. Barely. Oh, did you? Barely. But I ra rather than not say something, I thought I'd point it out now just in case there's something you can adjust. Um, um, so, yeah, something I wanted to uh, to throw out there to make sure we have the best audio possible. I really just and one more thing I want to say before we hop into the trailer. Uh, we got to do these Patreon shout-outs really quick. We've got Gilberto Inez and Brandon Hanna and his lovely parents were actually at the uh, Collider Building this last uh, week. We met his parents, and, and we know Brandon. He's been a longtime supporter of the show. Yes. He dresses up very well as Ben. Uh, so to our new patrons, as always... We salute you. We salute you. I think you said Inez. Is it, is it Yanez? Maybe? Yanez. Maybe. I want to make sure we take our best shot at we getting do. it correct here. And you are much better at pronouncing the names than me, <laughs> surprisingly. Uh, I don't know why that's surprising, but it is it's very surprising to me. So, yes, guys, uh, we're a little all over the place today, but we are here to talk about this movie. Coming up today on the show, we're going to have a call-in from Paul Denuzo, our Brigadier General of the Action Army. We're going to be talking about top five Ed Harris roles, uh, some AMA questions that came up, some other fun stuff. So, uh, without further ado, I suggest we get into the trailer for The Abyss. And in underwater. Two years ago, <laughs> in an unfinished nuclear power plant. Oh, I like this guy's trailer. Was. Yeah, I do too. It became one of the most challenging motion pictures ever made. I feel like if I was dying, I would want and him to narrate August it. And on August 9th, the most original adventure of the summer will begin at theaters everywhere. Oh, oh please don't kick in summer music right now. From James Cameron, the writer and director of The Terminator and Aliens. Well, I think I know why. God, I hate that bitch. I probably shouldn't have married her then, huh? Hang on, gentlemen. So, this movie was made in 89, and 
question is, when did James Cameron marry Catherine Bigelow? <laughs> because the parallels to a strong woman <laughs> in the way these characters interact oh. are, is like shocking. So I'm curious, let's, let's find out. Spouses. It's like during the movie. Catherine Bigelow, 89 to 91. So oh, really? He married her like. So they were dating when he was making writing and making this, which makes sense because like, she's like she's like she's the hero of the of movie. Yeah. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I don't think they mean us any harm. I don't know how I know that. They also like never really tie up the whole like water. Whatever thing. happens. What do you mean? They can like mimic us with water. Oh yeah, like why they're they don't ever, they don't ever give us a why with the aliens. It just like happens once and then like that's it. And they're just there. Yeah, that's a little bit of a problem. Yeah, I think the ending is really why. Talk to me, bud, please. Do you hear me? It's pretty good scene. I love Ed Harris so much. Big fan. Big fan of Ed Harris. I need to know if you're okay. You can't leave me here alone. You never backed away from anything in your life. Now fight! So that's a great line. So really interesting trailer because it starts off like very not on brand and it actually ends up getting there. Yeah. Uh, I think that could be a part of why maybe people didn't watch it a lot, but it's not like people just didn't watch it. It was it was it was still moderately successful. Yeah. It's also like it's not like people didn't watch it. Like it's a James Cameron movie. Like people love this movie. This is like one of those movies that comes up that people like have that real attachment to it. Yeah. You know? It's like the same thing as when people are like, oh, you know, the the game is my favorite David Fincher movie. Yeah. Something right. Like that. Well, yeah. Which is which is like I brought this up like before the show, but it's like there's those there's those movies that directors make where they have the unfortunate placement of being between two of their classics. So like with Fincher, you know, he makes seven follows it up with the game, and then he makes Fight Club. How is the game ever going to be regarded as anything other than, like, that pretty good movie that great director made? Which right. is the same as this. It's like, he makes Aliens, this, and then Terminator 2, two of arguably the, the greatest, greatest action movies ever made. Ever? Yeah. yeah like, and then, like, The Abyss is like, oh, yeah, and he also made a really good movie in between them. And they, they, stop. Yeah. I want to talk to you about Aliens, and I want to talk about Terminator. Not every director has it quite to the degree of, like, the examples we just used, but there are a lot of directors that have that. It, it, what it actually happens with is it's, it happens with directors who are not as prolific. So, like, for instance, like, Scorsese's made, like, 35 or, like, 45 movies or something. So with him, you're like... All right, like you, you make great movie, great movie, okay movie, okay movie, too great movie. Like you know what I mean? Yeah. He makes so many that it doesn't feel that way. With somebody yeah. like Fincher who has like ten movies, or Cameron who's got like seven movies, it's like right, and they're so far and few between that when they come out, there's just such a huge impact. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I want to actually hop in first with my thesis statement. I know you want to, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say Jackie Brown for Tarantino is just like that because it goes. Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, Jackie Brown, Kill right. Bill. Right, and, and Jackie Brown is good. Between. Yeah. And I've actually watched it twice in the last six months. Um, good movie. It's just, a good movie. Just not great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so thesis statement, you know, your big bold thought about the film if you were at a party or if you only had one statement, one idea you could make about it, uh, this would be it. It should be based on hyperbole. It shouldn't be my favorite this or I really liked when this happened. Um, and mine is, is that James Cameron... I had one that was like easy, which is like this is his most underrated film, which yeah. is like a very easy, it's a obvious strong one. one you can go with. Yeah. yeah, and like so that's kind of like you know what my back back one is. But I think for me, James Cameron is the most successful director in his visuals aging. Right. Well, I think at one point, one of our uh, when we did the ten rules of AMA. I think one of the ten rules is that James Cameron is the most timeless movie director of all time. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I just go back and I steal that rule, which is exactly that, which is James Cameron is the most timeless movie director of all time. Go back and watch Terminator 2. Go back and watch the beginning of Aliens. Go back and watch this film, and you see the you know the water, and, and that yeah. it's, it's really badass how he does it. And then also, in 20 years, go back and watch Avatar. Yeah. You know, the very first ever practical 3D movie. Um, I still to this day 
believe that uh, watching Avatar in theaters was one of the greatest experiences ever yeah. uh, in a theater. It was so beautiful. It was something that we'd never seen before. It was so experiencing crazy. 3D the way it should be seen. He made a new camera that cost a million dollars or like five million dollars just for that movie he created a camera like i think we should do another show and we should make a million dollar camera for it we it'll, should it'll improve the quality of the show you'll be able to <laughs> smell us uh yeah so i i just think and thank you for helping me tie that together was that yeah i think james cameron is the most timeless director and he's proven it once again in a movie that was completely forgotten about essentially by most of the general movie viewer you know not yeah. you know movie critics obviously know about it but like i never went out of my way to watch the abyss until i was called to and like yeah so the fact that it's unavailable is a strong testament to how sort of irrelevant of a movie it is to, to a lot of people right that i think that type of shit wouldn't fly if you were talking about aliens or like some movie like that that's part of a successful franchise oh you're saying yeah 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 i agree i absolutely agree you know he'd get around to it this is just that movie that he made and it's like i wonder how james cameron feels about this movie now when he goes back to it this is funny you know because you mentioned that uh you know jackie brown insomnia prestige or other ones and yeah and ben actually wanted to do kind of like a quick segment but i actually had to cut it because i didn't think we were gonna have enough time yeah but it's true there's so many great movies like in the prestige i think is is maybe the best example that we between can use right batmans. now between the two batmans yeah yeah. And then Inception comes out after. It's like Prestige is just kind of forgotten about. Yeah. It's arguably your favorite I Nolan it. film. You I know, like, uh, so yeah, he, I love Nolan so much. And the Prestige is so good. So it is very interesting how that happens with great directors. And it's like you almost do too much greatness at once and you, and you get forgotten about. It's also hard. Like when you're talking about great, you make you make great things. You have a lot of great achievements. It's one of them will be the, le the least good. Yes, Or exactly. one of them will be the least publicized for one reason or another, and, like, that's just what's going to happen, so... Yeah, you and I had the uh, the honor and privilege of being on the Spielberg countdown for Collider, and that was one of those things where it was like, when you get to the top ten, it's really just kind of moving around favorites. Yeah. And when you get to the top five, it's literally just personal opinion. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. So um, that is that is going to be our thesis statement. That's yours. I'm going to jump in with mine next. And my thesis statement is going to be that The Abyss contains the most, the most emotionally impactful scene in any James Cameron film. I, yeah, I love it. And I'm, and I'm like, I'm like sad that it's not mine Yeah. because it's so good. That is... S those two scenes, but mainly the first one. Sorry, yeah. it's your thesis. Yeah. I got excited. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, this the scene when they're they're in the pod after Michael Bean implodes, and and they, you know, she's like, I'm gonna have to suffocate. My blood will go ice cold. You have to tow me back. And he's like, No, the no, water's rising, no and they're running out of time. And you, and they're realizing it's the only option. And he doesn't really believe in it, but he has no he has no answer. And he's even saying to her like just beforehand, I, I thought this was like one of those. Uh, kind of great indicators of the characters themselves is he says to her like you're smart you're really smart think of something right. as she's freezing and the water's rising right like because he because he knows he she's no smarter answer. than he is yeah he knows exactly. he knows it and he knows that she's the smart one and he knows that he's desperate and he doesn't know what to do and there's that line just before the water rises and she says i'm scared is this I'm a scared. good idea is this a, oh my god God, and this scene is just heartbreaking. And she and she goes under, and then he's got, and she's looking at him through the through the fucking helmet, and it, her hand goes limp, and he screams, and then he dra drags her back, and then the revival. I mean, the whole entire like, yeah. and the 12, revival. We both think she's dead. The whole entire twelve or so minutes of this is so much more emotionally impactful than like really any other Cameron movie because like this is so much better than the freezing scene or the paint me like one of your French girls scene in oh, Titanic like, yeah it is it is leaps and bounds more heart-wrenching in my mind yeah I agree I mean I, Titanic I guess would be the one that has the, the, the closest the next best one yeah because it has some pretty epic scenes but like this scene in this movie and like when I say like most emotionally impactful what's crazy about that is think about how many times you've talked about a James Cameron film and a scene in particular, whether and, whether it's that scene you just talked about, paint me like one of your French girls, or uh, whether it's just like the crazy visuals in Avatar, or whether it's like I'm king of the world, yeah, or you know, I'll be back, or, yeah. or, or or anything. Like there's so many moments and so many scenes in these Cameron movies that get referenced all the time, even if it's just you know quoted to laugh. This scene I've never heard anybody talk about ever, never ever once has someone been like you've got to go watch the drowning scene in abyss if you want to get your heart wrenched go watch it top of the line acting great storytelling great writing like no one yeah. ever 30 years no one's even thought to mention it
Crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. So that's my that's my thesis statement, guys. I really was I was really blown away by that scene. I really loved it. And uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna continue through the show here. So uh, the next part on the show we like to do is something called fist pump moment. And I think we kind of are both doing it right now with that yeah. scene because that scene's very clearly my fist pump moment. But fist pump moment is you know something happens, you kind of look around, you're like, are you seeing this right now? This is the coolest thing yeah. I've ever seen. This is so good. Um, and. I mean, for me, it's definitely that scene. It's just so, yeah, because it, is, it isn't like a, because it, it's not like a, yes, she lived. Yeah. Because you kind of have that. It's when he starts, for me, it's when he, when he slaps her. Yeah, and he, and he starts, starts yelling. Her a bitch, and he's like, you, get, he's like starting to fight. give up. You're, yeah, yeah you fight, fight, you know, you've you never, never walked away from it yes. in your whole life. That's, those moments, like, those are pretty great. There, there was that moment, and then the other fist pump moment for me, I'll just say, because I just used that one, was uh, when he gets to the bottom of the the ocean and he sends the one. I knew this was a one way ticket. Yeah, it's, that was my. That's my favorite line. Yeah, is uh, is that because it's just they. I mean, the, their their relationship in this movie is the best part of the whole movie by like a very wide margin. Yeah, it's, and we we. Uh, who was it? Was it Jimmy O? No, no, no. It was uh, Ryan Ryan Brookhart. Yeah, Ryan Brookhart, the director, a friend of ours who came on. He says that every James Cameron movie is a love story, and ever since then, I've watched all of his movies differently. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. Just gonna clink around um, these Altoids here. Yeah, that's right. Do your thing. Uh, uh, I've lost my train of thought now. Would you like an Altoid? I'll take one. Why not? Um, and there's a really beautiful love story between the two of them. So, if that's your fist pump. Is that what you're going to take as your fist pump? I'll go with that as my fist pump, just because the the revival scene like we just talked about. Yeah. Mine, honestly, it's when Bean's pod implodes. implodes. I, it's that was... so sick. Yeah. And you see him in there, like, freaking out. Yeah. Ah! yeah. It, 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 it's really awesome. And it's, like, the realest action moment in the whole movie. Yeah, they're being chased, then he starts to go over the edge, and you're like, you're so effed now, man. I mean, I, I think for me, uh, a big reminder that I probably had never watched this movie all the way was that I didn't really remember that Michael Bean was the bad guy. I had, like, sort of just forgotten. Yeah, same. I thought about putting on a fake mustache and coming into the show today <laughs> and not saying anything and not acknowledging it and just doing it. I would have loved that. Like, maybe even, like, don't even put it on and, like, just, just before the show goes live, you, like, turn around and I, like, go down <laughs> here and I just put it on real quick and just don't acknowledge it because he has a sweet mustache. It's epic. Yeah. It's really epic. These Altoids are, it's a lot. Yeah. You're uncomfortable? I just, I don't know what to do with my <laughs> mouth. Yeah. You don't want to clink at your teeth because we're on mic. Mm, is that what it is? Yeah, you want to be careful. Uh, so Richard Eric Jarvie <laughs> here says, Fist Pump is undoubtedly the revival, but the other one was when Lindsay hears Bud snoring and just says, turn on your side, Virgil, and he does it instinctively without saying a word. <laughs> I did like that. It's a very, uh, very couple moment. We all know that. Yeah, yeah. Um... Uh so, so I, I, I think we can probably continue moving through though. Jarvie, just a, just a quick shout out and thank you. you know, we, we, we mentioned it for a second here, but uh, on the drunk watch along that we did over the weekend, which was an outrageously fun time. It was an incredible time. And there were, actually that will be up uh, on the, the Team Action YouTube channel, uh, which I don't think has a URL. We like haven't really started building it yet. That's like a thing Drew and I are going to start doing pretty soon. We're, we're old. We're, we're yeah. trying. <laughs> we're going to put we're up to figure it out. that drunk watch along for you guys to watch. Um, Paul Denuso and Richard Eric Jarvie. Uh, who should be, Paul Denuso should be calling in in just a second for fist bump, right? Yeah, yeah, he should be calling in any time. Uh, they sent us these glasses that were unbelievable. They they were personalized. They each, we each got one with our name on it, this action movie anatomy on it, and we we used them for the uh, for the show, and it was just the best thing ever. Uh, they are so awesome. Like, they're etched glasses, they're perfect little tumblers. Like, it's, the whole thing was just, was just super, super excellent. So, yeah, to Paul and Richard, thank you guys so much. And they also we, sent us a bottle of Lagavulin 16 that we drink all of. We drink the entire bottle of log 116 you know, uh, I thought about the fact that we're on camera for the entirety of that thing without any cuts and all of the alcohol we drink is in is in frame yeah it can't be faked like it should I, be we might have won a record we I think we'd make ourselves sick if we watched it back I think honestly we probably I should do a super cut that has every single drink just every shot in like like sped up yeah I, there's got we drank so much it was, yeah, it was an unhealthy amount of drinking. I had to go to work at 6 a.m. the next morning. I don't know. I, there it is. There he is. I don't know how you did that. I, I was dead. Nor nor do I. Paul Denuso, Brigadier General of the Action Army. A big salute to you, sir. Ha! Hey, hey! What's up, man? What's going on, gentlemen? Welcome back to the show. <laughs> we're, we're covering the abyss. Are you having fun? Absolutely, man. Love this shit. Love this movie. Love yeah. this movie. It's pretty great. Of course, you stole my fist pumps. Oh, of course we did. Was it the revival? That's all right. 
<laughs> the revival. That's the scene that made me love Ed Harris right there. It's so a pretty I, damn. Ed Harris is my favorite actor of all time. Yeah. And it was that scene that just made me go, wow, that bad. You never backed away from anything in your life. Now fight. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. But, it's, um, it's emotional. You know, Ed Harris is so intense. Uh, it's funny. I was going back through his filmography to like try to figure out when he first was breaking through. And I came across just because it's funny, like the, how intense he is in everything he does. Yeah. If you apply him to like a very strange premise, it just like makes the movie seem funny to me. So I came across a movie from 1981 <laughs> called Night Riders. Uh, let me tell you that this is this is the premise of Night Riders. A medieval reenactment troupe finds it increasingly difficult to keep their family-like group together. With pressure from local law enforcement, interest from entertainment agents, and a growing sense of delusion from their leader, who I'm sure is Ed Harris, who's way too intense to be a renaissance troupe leader. Like, But you know he's the most serious renaissance troupe leader of all time. Exactly. Uh, so, Denuso, you've now picked two movies for the, the show, and mm -hmm. you've called in twice now. And uh, what... Three about times, actually. Three times. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I did. Oh, God, <laughs> I'm such an idiot. Be better uh, at your job, Andrew. I'm just trying here. So, so about this film, what was it about the abyss? When was the, When did you first see it? And what was the impact the first time you saw it? And then why is that the second film for you to have nominated as a general? Uh, I was a. I think it was a junior in high school. I want to say right around that time, um, and I had just graduated from. Star Wars and not science fiction like that. So I was kind of trying to branch out. I knew Cameron was the name I had heard from a couple of different things like aliens and things of that Just nature. Just really quickly to interrupt. Um, so sorry. I went to this. I was going to say, it's so crazy for you to be like, I kind of heard that name Cameron being yeah. thrown around. I, I love <laughs> it, man. Such great context. Anyway, please continue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I had a, I was very much into movies right away, so I was hearing from older people that you should check out this director and everything else. And young James Cameron was right there. Um, so I went for the abyss, and I was just starting to get into acting myself. So I was kind of in that looking for who's your, who's the guy I want to be. I know this person, this person, Harrison Ford, and I saw this. And what I loved about Ed Harris is he has that the moment we talked about the big fist pump we talked about, but then he just everything about him was so truthful. Like he has the intense moments, but he has these real truthfulness about him that he can play real people. And it just, it just comes off so genuine. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, oh he's, absolutely. He's an, he's like, uh, he's intense. He's smooth. He's like authentic. He's lovable. I mean, that's, he truly is like one of the, the probably the most underrated actors ever to live. The fact that he doesn't have an Oscar right now is pretty crazy to me. Yeah, and he's only had what like a couple nominations throughout Maybe his whole three, career. I think. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Really yeah, quick. A couple of sporting. A couple. A uh, really quick story here that I've uh, that I've I've told you a few times. Yeah. Um. I my my theater director in college. He was actually the person that. Uh, pushed me in the right direction, offered me a, a talent grant, and kind of helped me figure out my life. Uh, his name's Patrick Torelli. He's a really, really great man. Um, Patrick and Ed Harris used to study theater together in New York, and he would tell me, they did it for years, they, they worked together for years, and he, he would tell me that you could just tell with Ed, he was one of the most intense people you'd ever meet, but you could just tell with the way that he carried himself that he was going to be one of the greatest actors who ever lived from day one. He could just see it on his face and the way he carried himself and the way he conducted himself professionally. And uh, it's really crazy to think back to that was probably 40 years ago. And the, or 50, yeah, 40 oh, years ago, yeah. And then now it's like you talk to me about seeing him for the first time in this movie and it's sticking with you is... And it's probably exactly the same thing, what you recognize and what Patrick recognized. It was just like, holy shit, this guy. This is like when he starts to break through. I mean, his mid-80s is like, he's in stuff with big people. I mean, he's definitely an actor that was in movies. Yeah. But, I mean, this is a James Cameron hit. Like, he's in this movie, and this is sort of and the he's next a star. Yeah, you know? and the next the next little while is where the career really takes off. And we'll get there in a second, obviously, talking about his uh, career profile. But uh, it's interesting that he was... I mean, he's already kind of balding. He's already like in his forties, I think, at this point. You know, he's like he. I think he was born balding. I'm maybe. gonna be honest. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. true. Yeah, he's had a great career, and he's and he's and he's had a career that's gone very far as well. I mean, even like now, he's prominent again with Westworld. Yeah. Right. Yeah. My yeah. favorite part of Westworld. Yeah, me too. I just love Ed Harris. I, I've never interviewed him, but uh, you and. Didn't you and I see him? We saw him at the Kodachrome premiere. Yeah. And, uh, we fanboyed out more than we do over most anything I, i'm no no joke um the, i probably shouldn't tell these stories on air but i will um i was i was at 
I was at a screening of I think Super Troopers two, and I hated that movie. Which I yeah, we it was not good. And I remember I went in and like I went to the bathroom, and as I was leaving, I knew that Ed Harris was there for for Kodachrome, and I was like, maybe I'll just see if they'll just like let me. I was for another outlet, not for popcorn talk, but I was like, maybe they'll just see if they'll just like let me in and then I can oh, go to the after party and hang yeah, out with yeah. Ed Harris. I like went and tried and they were like, your name's not on the list. I was like, I'll be right back. And I was like, went back into Super Troopers. But, um, <laughs> God, I hate this movie. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, man, I need, I need an opportunity to talk to Ed Harris. Um, so anyway, that's, that's cool, man. Yeah. I mean, so, so Ed Harris is your guy. You, you love it. You see this film. Uh, I mean, why, so this film's pretty close to your heart. Like you've watched it a number of times over the years. Oh, I watched. I, I haven't watched it recently. It was actually glad I brought it up here because I haven't watched it for about six, seven, eight years. But I mean, I watched it religiously throughout junior high, even to the point of beyond the acting purposes. I used to go to my pool and try to pretend to like <laughs> hold my breath a lot and then come up silently, like in just right before he yeah, yeah, yeah. challenges Michael Bean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> it, <laughs> I practiced that, so I was I was killer at that. I could have done that, no no doubt. That I love that man. That's exactly like that. That is such a like being a kid and being obsessed with like an actor, uh, an actor's story. So um, you wanted us to play a couple games here, and you wanted us to talk about maybe our top five Ed Harris films, and we're and we're gonna get to that. Um, do you want to let us know what your top five are? Do you want us to just break that down on the show? Or what, this is your moment, my man. Okay, I'll throw my. This is again. I actually haven't. As much as he's my favorite actor, I've only recently discovered a lot of his catalog. Um, yeah, well, I'm looking at his IMDb right now, that. and he's got like 102 movies. He's also in the new Top Gun, Maverick, yep. which is exciting. Yep. And yeah, yes! I've probably only seen maybe 33 percent of his catalog. Ah, eh, maybe 40 percent of his catalog. Yeah, I, right? I would say I'm, I'm maybe even less than that. I mean, I've seen all the big ones, but all that stuff in the '80s and a lot of the '90s stuff I've never seen. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, should we all do go jump into the number five here? Yeah, so what's, what's your uh, number five, Paul? Okay, well, I didn't really rank them per se. I couldn't do that in my heart. But yeah. I'm going to jump in with five and say Kodachrome. Oh, really? Kodachrome, which I really dug. Really? So I, actually... I really thought his character in that was very – it was one of those things I talked about, the intensity of the of the real truthful person. And that sequence with Sudeikis or whatever where he says, you know, Sudeikis like, well, why, why did you come? He's like, I just want to see if you're the asshole I always knew you were. How am I old? How am I doing there? I haven't watched it. Interesting. Yeah, I haven't seen it either. So that definitely is very surprising to me. I, I had no idea that it was that good. So uh, my number five is going to be Enemy at the Gates. Oh, I've never seen that movie. He plays the Russian sniper, sniper who is right? very, sniper. very good, and him and Jude Law are Jude hunting Law. each other. I mean, not Russian, excuse me, German, and uh, and Jude Law's Russian, and yeah, he's he's really badass in it. My he number kills five, a kid. He hangs a kid. Savage. Yeah. My number five is going to be The right. Hours. Uh, uh, yeah. 2002. Uh, I love The Hours. I was a big fan of this movie. It's the one that Nicole Kidman won her Oscar for. And um, I don't really remember the movie all that well, but he's like a dying... He's like cancer, I think, in the movie. And he he's... Uh, uh, AIDS. That's what it is. He's got AIDS. That's right. And he's... Uh, yeah, he's really good in this movie. I just I just remember really loving him in this. Um, so that's my number five. Okay. What do you got? Uh, number four, Paul. Number four, I'm going to go probably with Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Okay. Yeah, I so, figured. I, I know that's on well. Ben's list as well. It's not on my list, actually. Yeah, I love that movie. Uh, I like so, that. I love that movie all around, but he, just yeah. him with all those heavyweights, just the dial. I mean, he's it's, great. Yeah. It's the dialogue, of course. But. And where is Mr. Roma? Well, I'm not a leash, so I don't know, do I? Yeah, yeah that's a really great. <laughs> I actually I need to rewatch that film, but Ben and I watched the scene the other day. Uh, very, very great scene. So uh, for me, number four, I'm going to say Gone Baby Gone. That's my number four as well. Really? Yeah. He's he, great in Gone Baby Gone. He's, you fuck, you, what does he say? He goes, uh, right fucking there. He's yeah. like, you bet I would. He's like, he's so great. He's, he's awesome. so intense. He's so intense. And then like his, his, the way he goes out in that movie is, is like, you know, he goes into the bar to rob him and kill everyone. He's like, Remy Rassad stole, blah, 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 blah. Remy Rassad stole Amanda McCready. Remy yeah, Rassad. Yeah, yeah. And he just keeps saying his name over and over and you see him freak out. Yeah. And then he gets shot. He's like, that bartender wasn't fucking around. Yeah. I got it. He's <laughs> so good. The movie's really good. I love that movie. Oh yeah. I think uh, I love that movie too. Yeah, I think Ed Harris. I don't. I've, I've heard that he doesn't. Uh, he takes himself very seriously. I, yeah, and, and I've so, heard that. And because uh, I was thinking, like in terms of writing a comedy, 
if he was able to like channel his an over intensity if we could get him to play michael keaton in yes in the uh guys, in the other guys it would yeah. be absolute solid gold if he if he was able to make a fun of himself ah. a little bit into how intense he is i think he would be just amazing would you like to supersize it <laughs> yeah <You> know, like <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're like or or if he's like the father of the girl that like j- that like michael sarah's trying to date right, right. or something <laughs> he'd be great uh <laughs> all right what do you got uh number three paul Truman Show. Yeah, it's high for me. It's, it's yeah, that's uh, a, that's my next one. Number three is show. is Truman Show for me as well. That's gonna be my number two. Your number two. So what's your number three? My number three is Glengarry Glenn Ross. Okay, okay. Yeah. And he's great. I mean, Glengarry Glenn Ross, like you know, he he doesn't have the showiest role in the movie. Um, and he does. He ends up being a little one note for a lot of it. He doesn't get a lot of depth in that movie, but he's just great at it. I mean, it's just he brings a lot of. He very he's very mammoth. He, he's a, he's probably the most mammoth character in that whole movie. Okay. The way that he talks, it's super like everything's short and stylized and fuck you and fuck this. And right, like, right, right, right. You know. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I'm. I don't think a history of violence is going to make any of our lists, but I, I do like it's him a in great that. One. Um, Paul, what's your number two? Two is the abyss. Okay. okay. Yeah, this, yeah. I didn't include the abyss on my list because it was brand new. Um, I my number my number one is obviously stepmom. So. <laughs> I was gonna say it better be stepmom. I'll take milk money. I feel like all of our number one has got to be The Rock. How is it not? How is it your general yeah. Francis X Hump? I mean, is that what yours is, Paul? How is it not? Yeah. Okay. It's The Rock. Yeah. Obviously. Greatest villain slash hero of all time. He deserved Imagine a fucking Trump. Oscar nomination for that movie. Oh, he deserved an Oscar nomination for that. He didn't he get one for the Truman Show? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And he also he sh- did he get one for Beautiful Mind? Because that's my number two. Oh really? Yeah. I don't even really remember him in Beautiful Mind. I love him in Beautiful Mind. I love him and and uh, and Russell Crowe. He's so good at like pushing the narrative and making the movie more and more uncomfortable and adding that. Who is he in that movie? He is his figment of imagination, oh. government uh, I employee. I thought that was Paul Bettany. Paul Bettany is his best friend. Ah, got also it. figment of his imagination. Oh, they're both fake. Yes, which I love in the very like the very end of Beautiful, Beautiful Mind is one of my favorite movies. Great movie, I yeah. love it. I love at the very end when he just goes, Josie never gets older. It's like what? He's like, whatever her name is, oh. the young girl. He's like, yeah. she never gets older. And that's when he finally realizes after like thirty years of having visions that like. Yeah, she's never aged a day, and I've never even thought about it. Yeah, and like that was that, so. Anyway, uh, but yeah, Ed Harris in that movie is is great. Yeah, cool. I have to go back and watch yeah, it. Again. Absolutely. Uh, all right, hell yeah, Paul. Well, you know, it's funny uh, though. You know, it's funny. Oh, go ahead. Uh, real quick, I'm sorry. Real quick, it's no. funny. None of us mentioned Apollo 13. I know. It's, I it's, know. it's on my list here, yes, right next all, to Stepmom. Yeah, it's on. <laughs> it's on my honorable mentions. <laughs> and Appaloosa too is really, really good. <laughs> Oh yeah, he's good enough. And I honestly like I need to watch more of Westworld, but what I did see in Westworld, he was he's sweet. He's great. He's there's there's a quality that a lot of these guys, these intense older dudes get to when they reach a certain age and they start to feel like the old version of themselves that takes a bit of adjustment and he's kind of in that phase now where right. when I see him in Westworld, he's great, but he he like he just doesn't quite have like he just doesn't have quite the same level of swagger. He feels he's not like, quite Bill Pullman in the new Independence Day, no, but he's no, definitely no. not old Bill Pullman in the original. But it's yeah, it's a different it's a different vibe. So I think that that's it always takes a little adjusting to your heroes as they start to get into the next phase. Yeah, and I think he's kind of getting yeah. there. So, um, all right, I think Absolutely. that's gonna wrap that up. So Paul, thank you so much for calling in, man. As always, we appreciate all the support, all the all the love. Once again, thank you so much for the glasses and the and the whiskey. Yeah, dude, it was it, those those were absolutely incredible. Ben and I truly, truly adore them, and uh, we had a really great time on Saturday, man. Oh yeah, it was a blast. I want to shout out Marissa Serafini. Yeah, she's the one who helped us uh, get that package to you. So thank Rockstar. you, thanks, yeah, Marissa. Thanks, Marissa, and thank you so much, Paul. We'll talk soon, brother. All right, take care, man. Bye. See you, bud. Um, all right, so that is going to be our top five at Harris Films. So we I love also, that guy. He's a good dude. He's a really good dude. Paul's a good person. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're so lucky with our fans. We really are. Uh, so, Ed Harris, let's do career profiles really quickly here. Um, Field of Dreams, Jackknife to Kill a Priest. This is kind of what I was talking about a second ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I think we can probably do Mary, Mary Elizabeth, Master Antonio at the same time because okay. they're in a similar position here, which is that the films they did directly preceding The Abyss are not particularly huge films. Field of Dreams is a big one. It's the same year, mm-hmm. so it's not really preceding it. And for her, Color of Money is three years earlier, which is a big film, but Slam Dance, The January Man, To Kill a Breeze, Jackknife, they're not really big movies. No, like, it's 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 more about like 
the couple of things they did right before this was released, you know, for Ed Harris, that, you know, as you said, filled the dreams and color money for her, and then kind of where their careers went for the next, like, decade yeah. afterwards, um, a lot of people consider this the golden age for Ed Harris, is this is the starting point. Yeah. Um, and I don't disagree. Uh, I do truly believe, and I know that you do as well, that he's one of Hollywood's most underrated actors. So uh, another segment that Paul asked us to do was over under proper for Ed Harris, but we don't really need to because Ben and I truly believe he's very, very severely underrated. Yeah. But I think that's a part of the whole thing that you said in, in that like he takes himself a little too seriously. Maybe if he would have lightened up a little bit throughout his career, he'd have a little bit more opportunity throughout. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, it, it is it is fascinating to see. We <laughs> Now that we work in the business and, and we spend enough time around these people in various events and parties and carpets and things, some of them you get to know, some of them you're a little closer to because you hear stories. And then others, you know, you realize that they're real people. Like, you have friends that are talented that can be a pain in the ass. Absolutely. You have friends that are talented that can be maybe not assertive enough. Yep. You realize that these icons, these legends, you know, sometimes they're... they've experienced great luck or, you know, great fortune from being involved with the right person, but their career takes the wrong turn and they kind of disappear. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the profile on Chevy Chase that came out yesterday. I've just heard he's one of the worst people. I've heard that him and Bill Murray are two of the worst actual individual human beings to deal with on a personal level. Oh, I've never heard that about Murray. I've heard it from bo of both of them. Yeah, Chase is, is notorious. He's the famously, he's like, the guy that left after a year of the original SNL, you know, tons of cocaine, tons of money. And, but like this new interview, he's like 74 and he just like is the worst. Yeah. And it just does, does himself no favors. And it's crazy reading it where you're just like, that's why. Yeah, that's the just, reason. He's condescending and he's dismissive and he's he's just, yeah, it's it's a really big bummer when you see that. And like, you really try to separate. Yeah. You really do. But then you think about it when you watch their movies and you just, you can't, you feel, there's like a bad taste in your mouth. You yeah. You can't help it. Agreed. Um, so production development here, it's, it's interesting because we're going to, I'm actually, I'm going to just opt to skip it today. And I'm going to say it in this sense. We got James Cameron and Gail Ann Hurd, who is a power, power couple for a while, yep. right? Yep. Uh, they were married um, for a little bit there. But James Cameron, one of the most successful, prolific directors of all time, Gail Ann Hurd, same thing, except for producing wise. Yep. She has been there for everything. You might recognize her from a little show called The Walking Dead, Aliens, Armageddon, T2, Armageddon, T2 Aliens. Um, They've done it all. So we've actually covered both of them many times on this show, so that's why I'm going to skip yeah. it. Yep. <clears throat> so moving on here to critical and box office, this movie cost in the mid-40 millions to make. It wasn't exactly clear uh, with um, with advertising. It was released by Fox on August 9th of 1989. It grossed 54 domestic and 35 million worldwide for a grand total of 90 million, so it just barely doubled its money. And in its opening weekend, it was number two behind Parenthood in its second week. Love so, so that's kind of the thing. Is like you look at the trailer and you're kind of like, huh? And then you talk about in between the two movies, you're like, okay. Yep. Um, I don't want to see you be creative yet. I want to see you make me awesome action movies with like monsters and and robots. Yeah, I mean, he had a fascination with science fiction and creatures from the beginning, and he's pretty much stuck with it almost his entire career. You know, he had a he had a bit of a break, you know, between uh, True Lies and Titanic, uh, where, where they're a little bit more grounded films. Right. But on the whole, he has been somebody who's focused heavily on science fiction, aliens, things like that, his whole career. And yeah, I mean, this movie, I think I think from, a, from the perspective of, of it being great or not, I think we both have the same feeling, which is that it's probably about 25 minutes too long. And the yep. ending is a really weird and unsatisfying turn. Yep, yep, absolutely. I think those are the knocks on this movie. I think other than those two details, it ends in a strange way that doesn't feel completely necessary. I don't mm -hmm. think the aliens need to come to the surface. I don't think it helps the story or does anything. It doesn't really explain anything. And it drags a little bit at, at points. It definitely has, like, it's Sunshine is very reminiscent because yeah. of, like, the weird yeah. monster movie chasing thing. You know, Michael Bean coming in is, like, a crazy mutinous crew member and you know with underwater dementia and then yeah the ending kind of i actually like the ending of sunshine more yeah um but yeah I, I agree the ending of this feels a little odd and the whole like we should be dead but we're not and here's ed harris again and like yeah. everyone's happy um but yeah it's interesting so it's got a 7.6 on imdb which that seems fine like yeah. i could maybe see a 7 8 or whatever not not the end of the world it's got uh, 89 by all critics 69 by top and an 83 by audience and and you you got to think that that 69 has got to be a lot of what you and i just discussed yeah 
Um, feels a little sprawling and it just doesn't quite realize its vision. It is. Do you ever find fascinating the idea that these science fiction films, um, oh man, I've been talking on the top, the top of the mic this whole time. I should be here. Great. Good for me. It's our first, first show. <laughs> first show. First show. Um, that like these sprawling science fiction, there are aliens movies tend to like follow a lot of the same beats and, and end up when you give the big like weird reveal at the end that it's aliens, right? It often doesn't really do what the director wants it to do. Like like Interstellar has suffers from that same sort of thing. Yep. Contact absolutely suffers from that exact yep. same sort of thing. Uh, this movie definitely suffers from it. It's like somehow, hmm. somehow like the idea of aliens is way more satisfying than like the person having the strange ethereal multi dimensional run in with them. Right. That, like then you're just like they're like great aliens exist. Confirmed, well, and that's why it, it's, it explains so much his fascination with the sea because there's the two unknowns are the sky and the sea, yeah. right? And so it makes sense that that's why James Cameron would go and play there because there's no rules. But yeah, it is really tough to make that payoff of the the reveal be like. I mean, we all knew it was aliens throughout the movie. We'd seen yeah. them a couple times, but even then, it's like when you see their world and, and the him and Ed Harris go flying hand in hand and then like the ship comes up, you're just like, but why? Yeah, right, exactly. It's almost like the fact that Arrival gives us the aliens so early and they become an integral part of the story yes. makes Arrival such a better movie. It's, it succeeds so well because you're like, all right, cool, aliens, and they're not going to talk to me about a bunch of alien shit. They're going to talk to me about wanting to communicate yeah. with this species, which is much more interesting. That so good. It's so good. Yeah. And her and Renner and the storyline and just yeah. everything is wonderful. That I won't final, even, that I won't final even, 10 minutes. Yeah, I yeah. won't even spoil it because just in case you haven't seen it, even yeah. though it's been two years. It's amazing. Um, all right. Do we have uh, a favorite line? There's a couple. I mean, I love – I think my favorite line is specifically when he's screaming at her, I, when my, he's slapping her. That whole he, thing. Yeah, and you've never backed away from anything in your whole life. Um, I really, really love that moment. That, that was like – that line or the other one we mentioned uh, when – just before she drowns. Yeah, where she's like, I'm scared. I'm is sure it, this is a good idea. That's a great That's line. a wonderful yeah. idea. Like, because she's trying not to panic. Yeah. Because she knows she's about to die. It's crazy. And, and But, ugh. Yeah. You know your brain is like, you're. Do we got to stay alive. That scene is, that might be James Cameron's best scene I, ever. It, it might be. Yeah, I, I agree. I was like shocked, blown away. I texted you last night when yeah. I watched it. Just like, Wow. Like that that shit got me off guard. Yeah. I was like I was like doing the thing where I was watching the movie where I was like pretty pretty invested, kind yep. of paying attention, like, you know, like having to rewind a little bit here and there if Same. I felt like I zoned yeah. out, right? Like But then you hear this starting to happen. The, like the military guys getting in the water and they're trying to do something, you're not I was like, what the why are they running and what are they doing? Yeah, like where did this a little bit of go crazy? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then and then that happens and you're like, okay, the payoff is is real. <laughs> yeah, the payoff is a hundred percent real. Uh Sorry, we got a new uh, Eric Grebner in the chat for the very oh, first time. What's up, Eric time. Grebner? How you doing, uh, we man? We know him. And uh, yeah, very nice to see you, man. Um, and also, uh, Bigger Boat Movies, Eddie Green popped back into the chat. Uh, ben, you guessed it on his show the other day. What? Uh, just a funny note. I, yeah. Oh. Uh, but you guessed it on his show the other day. I did, yeah. Terminator 101, which is Eddie Green's show, it is unbelievable. It's so much fun. It, Eddie Green is a long time. Is a longtime uh, listener of this show. He's one of the earliest people. Should we just say it? Um, uh, we'll save it. Maybe we'll save it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, Eddie Green is a longtime listener of the show. He's one of the the, the most loyal people we, we've ever had on the show, and he does a, a new podcast called Terminator One Hundred and One on the on Anchor. He's, he's hosting it through there. It's all just Terminator news and stuff like that. And so um, I went on there and we we talked a little bit. And it's funny. He was asking me on the show, you know, in the Terminator franchise, kind of like who have you been around? You know, what have you done? And I. It was it was fascinating just uh, just sort of saying to him like, well okay like I interviewed Gail and Heard a few years ago for a Walking Dead thing and she was <laughs> great and I sat down with Michael Bean for about fifteen minutes a couple years ago and he was awesome and I was like oh and I was at the Creative Arts Emmys with James Cameron a couple years back and this is uh, what he's saying or what you're saying I was saying yeah, and I was, yeah. I was sort of counting through the different people and I was like oh yeah and I was on the same plane as Bryce Dallas Howard once she was also at a premiere that I was at uh, and I was like oh interesting like th these people yeah. <laughs> like that and I was like wow like I guess I, I guess if you live here long enough you just a franchise like Terminator, you're just like around a lot of those people, a lot. Yeah, like, I, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, they're 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 like some of the biggest names in Hollywood. Never Schwarzenegger. Never gotten to meet him. Never been in the same room even. But yeah, yeah, I was in the same room as him. But okay. that was like a, when we were at the. I was like a Fit Expo. Yeah, like years and years ago before I like yeah you know he'd probably remember you. I, I I'm sure he saw <laughs> me. I'm sure he. Uh, would. You know what? Here we go. Uh, so Ben and I were gonna save it. 
But Christian Hestis just said in the chat, yeah. hey, as my financial situation has improved, I have upped my patron to $50. I am now a proud general of the Action Army, and we are proud soldiers. We salute you. We salute Christian, you. Christian, thank you so much. We've got 30 people in the chat right now for The Abyss. So you and I are doing something right these days. <laughs> the uh, Abyss. It's, yeah. not, it's not even an available film to be watched. Yeah, and people are, are, are here talking 32. So uh, so Christian, thank you so much. Thank Paul, you so much, thank man. you for coming calling in uh we love you guys uh we still got a, a little bit more time and a couple questions to get through so yeah uh we got a great question here from keys keys cornelius who's been a fan of the show uh, the schmodown a long time Full metal trivia yeah full metal trivia him and um arena are are an excellent couple that was actually formed through the action army which is one of my favorite things ever yeah uh so keys says this is the third time that michael bean acted in a james cameron film the first two were terminator and aliens which of your of the three is your favorite and do you <laughs> favorite with a you and do you like that he was a villain in this one instead of being the good guy he was in the previous two? First of all Wonderful question. Yeah, I love that he's a villain in this movie. I also love his mustache. I yeah, and we've we've seen that Johnny Ringo, <laughs> uh, when he has a mustache, he's a badass. Um, and he's great. He's yeah. a Michael Bean is a very good. That's the thing about Michael Bean is he actually kind of has the look like he would just be a better villain. Yeah. Than a than a hero, but then you see him as John Connor, and you see him in The Rock, and you see him. Oh yeah, he's in The Rock too. There's uh, did you did you notice the strange like the strange parallels between this movie and The Rock? It's not like they're the same movie, but there's there's a bunch of details that just like feel reminiscent. Like obviously Michael Bean is is military in both films. He is he has to go underwater and he like dives right. in both films. Ed Harris is kind of a stern badass in both films. It feels a little bit like Michael Bay might have watched this movie and like just like wanted to borrow pieces that he liked and put them in his movie. I I I mean, a hundred percent. Yeah. Like, of course, Michael Bay would steal from James Cameron to make yeah. his movie better. Um, but yeah, I uh, I like him as a villain, and yeah. I think that my favorite performance from Michael Bean is is Terminator. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think it's just got to be Terminator. Yeah, Reese, man, he's 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 great. I mean, yeah, he's. Oh yeah, I said John Connor. My 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 apologies. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. Uh, he comes back, and you know, I travel across time for you, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. I've loved you since before I even met you. Yeah, that's yeah, a that's a great line. Yeah, I love that movie. Uh, you want to do the other one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the qu second question here is from Paul Oyama. Uh, is James Cameron the most overvalued director ever due to his box office success, and why do you think he's been so successful at producing a profit for his films? Uh, I mean, okay, this is the same way that Will Smith chose like sci-fi and alien movies early in his career as like what he was going to attach himself to. Yeah. If you do those movies right, they make a lot of money. It was in the days before uh, superhero films, so like. Those were the big fantastical box office tent poles that we would get. It's not like today, where if you made a movie like a new a new franchise like The Terminator, it like probably would bomb. Um, yeah, you know that's not really how it works anymore. Even even Avatar is like, but just before it really takes off. So um, to create new IP is really hard. He just had the luck and and not luck, but like the fortune that Terminator One was so successful. Uh, and the talent. I shouldn't say luck because then he was able to obviously turn the next film he made into Aliens. So, but again, like that's, he made a sequel to a film that was enormously successful. That's his second movie, right? Yeah. So like he got to piggyback. He, he was, he had that going for him is that if he made a great alien movie, it was a sequel to an already successful film. So his name becomes elevated by marrying his brand to the alien brand, right? And then from there he makes the abyss, which is a less exciting film. And then Terminator two, which is like his Magnus opus. At right. That point. Uh, yeah, it's hard to say overvalued because you think of the movies that he's done and you think of the things he's accomplished in filmmaking with the people he's worked with, the careers that he's created. Um, I don't think he's overvalued. I do think that... Um, what, is the, what is the word I'm looking for? It's, it's like we care too much about what he's doing. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You okay. know, he's like, like he's under too much scrutiny or something like that. Yeah, well, not even scrutiny, but just like he, he's just we care too much about James Cameron right now. The guy hasn't made a movie in so in long. A decade. In a decade. Right, and like, he had made a movie a decade earlier. Right. And so it's like to, to sit there and talk trash about him saying he's overvalued. I'm not saying that you're doing that, Paul, but to say that he's overvalued does does kind of take away from what he's given us, which is like arguably five of the most impactful films in their time ever. James Cameron has made one movie since 1997. <laughs> Wait, what? He made Titanic. Oh, right. And then he made Avatar. Right. That's it. That's it. In 98, yeah. the the 20 year period started where he made one movie. Yeah. He made one movie in two decades. And that's crazy. And what are the two movies? The two highest grossing movies 
ever ever <laughs> are yeah. those two movies it's and, it's kind of one of those things he yeah his brand is elevated by virtue of the success of those films and like you you know you can't lose if you don't play so like if if avatar had bombed fine it didn't so that's what he gets he and, gets and i just guy. yeah and i and it's hard for me to to think that someone else could have made titanic right and had it be the film it was today like maybe spielberg could have done it the talent like that's why i said i wanted to correct myself it's not luck the talent that cameron has is well demonstrated as a storyteller he's amazing yes and like even even his worst movies are still amazing so like we can expect probably the new avatars to be something special i don't know what they'll be um i'm curious to see what you know his impact on the new terminator film is going to be as a producer yeah you know that'll be that'll be curious and, I, and he did make he made uh, ghosts of the abyss and aliens of the deep um the two oh, documentaries yeah, yeah, yeah. so he was yeah, working right, he right. did stuff and he, and he shows up in, in entourage doing aquaman and That's people like, have been talking about that uh, a handful about his uh his obsession with the sea and yeah. the documentaries they're really cool yeah. i watched i watched one of them i think I, I think the one i watched was aliens of the deep i don't think i watched ghost of the Abyss. That's cool i like that yeah they're it's an interesting i mean he said he you find some crazy creatures in the ocean oh yeah they look like wild i, I, I think yeah the ocean terrifies me <laughs> <laughs> uh so what uh what three categories do you think we're here man yeah yeah there's three uh three categories in action films uh the first one is is totally ridiculous. That's going to be like Face Off, Con Air, Demolition Man, really kind of silly movies. Uh, the second one is going to be totally legitimate. That's going to be like, you know, Die Hard, The Fugitive, Lone Survivor, Gladiator, um, you know, films like Children of Men. And then uh, Ridiculously Legitimate, which is going to be the middle category. That's where the sort of ridiculous meets legit and you get those really grounded things that make the movie great, but maybe you laugh unintentionally here and there. So, you know, Predator. Like Ed Harris and The Rock. Point Break, The Rock, yeah. movies like that. Um, so really quickly before we do that, I wanted to say two things. Um, fans are wanting to send us more stuff, which makes me very happy. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm totally down with that. But uh, Jarvie said, also Cameron was one of the first ones to put female heroes to the forefront, and that will be one true. of his great legacies, which is very true. And then yeah. uh, really quickly, Denuso says, my thesis would have been that The Abyss is Cameron's interstellar, both in that it is highly underrated work in the director's catalog in comparison to the other widely praised work, and thematically, the third act is a bit divisive due to the alien nature and whatnot, yeah. which is, is 100% yeah. true. So, Has a lot of similarities, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, I, I think I have to just say it's totally legit because like I'm buying into the world already yeah and, and like i love all the uh like 90s character actors you see in the very beginning of the Chris movie Elliott, yeah 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 in the end of the movie exactly yeah. the book ends of the movie like you know with the submarine sinking in the very beginning like that scene is like 80 knots yeah it's like nothing goes that fast yeah 150 <laughs> knots you know it's like yeah, impact right. breach ah! and then they run to the wall like oh my god like it's all done so well uh that i'm sold on the world immediately so for me it's totally legit yeah, I, I think I'll probably go middle category on this. It's mm -hmm. right; it, it bridges right into totally legitimate. But I think the middle category because uh, the animation on the aliens is is a little weird. It's um, obviously you know predates great CGI, so the the aliens are kind of strange looking. Um, right. There's just that part of the movie feels very like campy '80s strange. Uh, the and, aliens in general. In the end, the fact that it raises up, it's just like. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I mean, may maybe maybe it's totally legit, and it's just that's just not the best executed part of the totally legit. Because I don't really laugh at that part. It's just it starts to just sort of lose me. Um, but and yeah, and, and then also like Michael Bean is great, but he's also like a little cartoonish. He's, like a little, yeah. as a, he's a little cartoonish yeah. as a villain. Um, so yeah, I think I'd probably put this in the middle category, but it's it's pretty close. It's pretty close. I, yeah. I did really love this movie, so that's fair. Um, so there's only one last thing left to talk about on the show, and that's called the pitch. Oh. So uh, we have some shit written down here, but I think we were just drunk. Um, uh, I don't know if this is what we're gonna do. There's a couple different options. Um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm pull it up right now, and I'll. I'll pass my phone over to you yeah i've created a spreadsheet <laughs> with the information you want to just send that to me yeah so. so those are the options i know that the next thing we do have brianne coming on for django in a couple weeks yep yep uh i think it's the first when or thursday in september is that correct uh yeah it looks that way um uh, looks yeah, yeah uh, django is no it's october 10th oh uh yeah sorry october i, yeah. I was like what month are we in yeah the next the first the first episode of next month um so we're not entirely sure. We were thinking maybe a Robin Hood film to kind of prep. Maybe we'll do Robin Hood, you know, the you know, Prince of Thieves, or maybe... you know what else we could do next week? Huh? MacGruber. 
No, because Will Forte is going to come on the show <laughs> He's going to come on the show. He's going to come on the show. I'm still holding out. I'm still holding out. Some uh, sweet movies on here. Yeah. So we w- honestly, what we might do is we're going we're gonna to announce it later in the week. Uh, we may do a Robin Hood film, but we realize the release isn't for two months from today. So it seems a little early. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll figure it out. And we'll let you guys know, of course. Yep, 100%. Yeah. So uh, last thing to point out, guys, there's two places you can find us uh, right now. The One of them is the Facebook fan page. There's Action Movie Anatomy, and there's the Team Action fan page, which is our Schmodown personas. Yep. Also, we have a Patreon. We've been sort of talking about it throughout the show, but haven't explained what it is. Patreon.com slash Team Action. Um, Andrew and I do additional content every single week. Uh, there's some really funny stuff we did recently where we were doing uh, impressions oh, of gosh. celebrities doing like, famous movie speeches. So I played... Uh, you know, Quaylen, John Lithgow's character from Cliffhanger doing the Tom Cruise Respect the Cock speech from Magnolia. Yes. He does uh, Albert Finney. Giving uh, Bill Pullman's Independence Day speech from Independence Day. Um, we have some others we'll be doing soon. So uh, that's the kind of stuff that you get. If you, There's a bunch. You can see the tiers all there. Um, obviously, the general here gets to suggest films for AMA, which is what you guys are seeing today with Paul and the Abyss. So patreon.com slash team action. Go check that out. There's additional stuff we put up every single week. We could just do A Star is Born next week. We could. If Christian suggested it, just we, to... Do you want to reenact the trailer right now? <laughs> Maybe it's time to let the old ways die. I just want to take another look at you. Hey. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we need to stop. Uh, that yeah, that wraps it up for us, guys. You can find me at Andrew Guy on uh, Twitter. You can find the show t- at Team Action Show. Uh, full. No, <laughs> you guys can find me at uh, Ben Bateman Media on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. There's a bunch of cool Schmodown shit coming up. We didn't do Schmodown Corner. Uh, we apologize. Yeah. We'll be we'll be back to do it soon. Bye, Bye. guys. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network. We would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Whitworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed here are those.